Welcome to the History of the Papacy podcast, a podcast about the history of the popes of Rome and Christian Church. Prepare yourself to step behind the ropes and leave the official tour of the story of the popes and Christianity. I'm your host, Steve Guerra, and I thank you for joining me on this journey. The next two episodes are something I don't normally do. They are holiday-themed special episodes. I'd like to thank longtime listener Michael Silbeck for prompting these episodes. Today's episode's a little indirectly related to the podcast, but has a very strong connection to this particular series, and that's the story of Hanukkah. Hanukkah is a really interesting holiday that connects many threads that we are talking about in this series, where we are trying to find the beginnings of Christianity before the times of Jesus Christ. Hanukkah is a really interesting holiday celebration or festival, or feast, you might call it. Not having grown up Jewish, but living in a neighborhood that had a fairly large Jewish population, I thought Hanukkah was in some way the Jewish Christmas. Kids got gifts and all all of the usual trappings of a gift-giving holiday. After marrying into a Jewish family, I still didn't have much of an idea of the theology or history behind Hanukkah beyond eating latkes and donuts. I did learn not to ask for ketchup or barbecue sauce to accompany the latkes. I learned that lesson very quickly. I knew as much as the next person about the miracle of the eight days of oil and all. That was about it. Over time, of course, I learned that Hanukkah isn't the Jewish Christmas. The story of the events celebrated on Hanukkah are fascinating and connect to events we've discussed in many of the episodes of this series in a way it sort of encapsulates all of them, particularly the successor Hellenistic kingdoms of Alexander the Great and the highly successful revolt of a group of Second Temple Jews called the Maccabees. This is a revolt that should have never been as wildly successful as it was. Let's start off with the quote from the second book of Maccabees as our jumping off point, because I think it'll really set the stage. Now Maccabeus and his followers, the Lord leading them on, recovered the temple and the city. They tore down the altars that had been built on the public square by the foreigners and also destroyed the sacred precincts. They purified the sanctuary and made another altar of sacrifice. Then, striking fire out of flint, they offered sacrifices after a lapse of two years. And they offered incense and lighted lamps and set out the bread of the presence. When they had done this, they fell prostrate and implored the Lord that they might never again fall into such misfortunes. But that if they should ever sin, they might be disciplined by him with forbearance and not be handed over to the blasphemous and barbarous nations. It happened that on the same day on which the sanctuary had been profaned by the foreigners, the purification of the sanctuary took place. That is, on the 25th day of the same month, which was Chislev. They celebrated it for eight days with rejoicing in the manner of the Festival of Booths, remembering how, not long before, during the Festival of Booths, they had been wandering in the mountains and caves like wild animals. Therefore, carrying ivy-wreathed wands and beautiful branches and also fronds of palm, they offered hymns of thanksgiving to him who had given success to the purifying of his own place. They decreed by public edict, ratified by vote, that the whole nation of the Jews should observe these days every year. Such then was the end of Antiochus, who was called Epiphanes. <laughs> 
And this is from the new revised standard version of the second book of Maccabees. You could say the story begins in the 500s BC. We're not going too far back here. The kingdoms of Judah and Israel had received some pretty bad lumps from various Mesopotamian empires. In the early 500s, Jerusalem was completely destroyed by the Neo-Assyrian Empire. The first temple of Jerusalem was destroyed. A certain portion of the population was forced into exile in Babylon. We've talked about this in earlier parts of this series and the 12 Minor Prophets series, which seems to have a, a lot of connections keep coming up with that series that I did with Gary Stevens. In short, the whole population wasn't exiled from the land. More likely, the merchant, part, at least portions of the merchant class and portions of the ruling class were exiled to Babylon. This type of population movement was quite common and served many purposes. Anyway, the exile didn't last too long, just a few decades until the Neo-Assyrian Empire was conquered by the Persians under Cyrus the Great. Cyrus freed the Judeans to return to Judah, which would be called Persian Yehud. Cyrus basically let the got the Judeans set up back in their own homeland and named a Judean governor who was named Zerubbabel. Funds were set aside for Zerubbabel to build the uh, temple again, which would become the second temple. This is all documented in various parts of the Old Testament. There could be some problems with the details, but overall the biblical account seems pretty accurate. Not a ton of outside of the Bible documentation exists, but there's some. Persian Judah or Yehud just wasn't a hugely important part of world affairs at that point. The temple did get built, built, and we have the second temple of Jerusalem. Time went along pretty well in Judea for the better part of two year, two centuries until... And this is where the story really begins. In 333 BC, Alexander the Great began working his way out of Asia Minor and into the, the Levant. There was the Battle of Isis in 333, and that was, real, that was in the northeastern corner of the Mediterranean. Alexander conquered the northern Levant with the Siege of Tyre, which he sacked the city, then the southern end of the Levant got conquered through the siege of Gaza, which Gaza got sacked. Alexander then conquered Egypt without any major battles. The areas that were fairly happy with Persian rule fought back. The areas that chafed under their rule flipped to Alexander pretty quickly. Take Egypt, for example. Egypt was never a fan of Persia, and they turned around really fast to Alexander. Alexander founded Alexandria in Egypt, which would become a huge center for Judaism, Second Temple Judaism, and later Judaism, and of course Christianity. Steve here. We are a member of the Parthenon Podcast Network, featuring great shows like James Early's Key Battles of American History podcast and many other great shows. Go over to ParthenonPodcast.com to learn more. And here is a quick word from our sponsors. Jews lived in all of these areas from Egypt and even beyond Egypt and Africa, all the way up through the Levant, east to Babylon, north into Asia Minor. The homeland of the Jews was Judea. They were literally the people of Judah. That is the etymology of the word Jew. The people still living in the former northern kingdom of Israel wouldn't be called Jews despite having a very similar religion and culture. They would become the hated Samaritans. As you well know, Alexander didn't live long, very long, to see his empire flourish. The empire was carved and sliced and diced up among his top generals. For today's purposes, two areas of concern were Egypt 
up through the southern Levant, which was ruled by the general Ptolemy, and a huge chunk of Asia, including the northern Levant, Fertile Crescent, Mesopotamia, and Asia Minor were dominated by the general Seleucus. The major fault line between these two powerful kingdoms ran straight through Judea, Israel, and the northern part of the southern Levant, I guess which you could call the central Levant. I've said all this throughout the series, but I'll say it again. Hellenism was the big game in all these places. Greek culture, government, language, learning, and institutions were laid on top of the local culture and institutions. Greek became more than just a lingua franca. Greekness became the currency of the entire East, and everyone wanted a piece of the action. At least most people. Hellenism was the way to plug into the vast wealth that all these former areas of Alexander's empire produced. The Hellenism of Egypt gave us the Septuagint translation of the Old Testament. Go back and listen to that six-parter. You won't be disappointed and you'll get what was going on here. And honestly, Christianity was very comparable to Hellenism. It was it was an idea. It was an, a thing, as we might say in the modern parlance. You when you tapped into Hellenism, when you tapped into Christianity, you tapped into this whole network of ideas. Hellenism caused problems, too. The Ptolemy kings were pretty light with their Hellenism. They blended the local cultures, predominantly Egyptian culture, but also Jewish and others, into their Hellenism. They took the best of all worlds and Hellenized it. This process wasn't all perfect, but it was fairly peaceful. Others, such as the Seleucids, took a more hard-lined approach to Hellenization. In fairness, the Seleucids were in a very different situation. They held a huge swath of land that was as different from one region to the next as you could possibly get. The The languages, the culture, the religion, ethnicity, geography, you name it, it was all different. They needed to make the Punjabs, Carians, Ionian Greeks, Syrians, and everyone in between work together. Hellenism was great, and a lot of peoples wanted on board, but others pushed back. So that required a little pushback from the Seleucids as well. Something like empire and a new overlaid culture can bring people together, but it can also cause major problems. In Judea, there were people who were all in on Hellenism, and there were traditionalists who were against everything about Hellenism, and there was really everything in between on that spectrum. Not surprising, when something new and game-changing comes along, there are winners and losers and people who just want to go along to get along. The Seleucids had their share of ups and downs. Where we stand in the 160s, 170s BC is that the Seleucids had some wins and some losses. Seleucid king Antiochus III, a.k.a. Antiochus the Great, is who we'll talk about now because he was the one who racked up a lot of those wins and a couple of the losses. In a long story short, Antiochus the Great took control of the area of the southern Levant, including Judea, from the Ptolemies. Antiochus the Great had a bunch of big winds out in the east as well, but there was a storm a brewing on the horizon with the coming of the Romans. After this big win against the Ptolemaic kingdom, he had a major loss against the Romans. Then Antiochus the Great was murdered, leading to the takeover by his son, Antiochus IV Epiphanes, which means the glorious or the illustrious or the God manifest. Antiochus IV shouldn't have been the next king by rights, but he took over anyway. Antiochus IV liked Hellenism, but instead of using it as a system to overlay over existing cultures and connect everybody up, he decided to force it upon everyone, make those round pegs fit into the square holes, or the square pegs into round holes, you know, you get the drift. But that's the way something like Hellenism can go. Either people can choose to accept it and own it, 
or they can be it can be forced on people. I think it's kind of comparable to quote unquote Americanism, and it can be seen in a similar light. I think whatever you think about Americanism, for better or for worse, we can see that there's a lot of overlap with Hellenism in these two systems. Culture can be unifying. It can be unifying by the choice of adopting it, or it can be unifying because it's been directly imposed. The Persians didn't do anything like that with their culture. All the different peoples that they conquered had to do was accept Persian suzerainty and exist fairly freely. The Greeks had a system that went along with their armies. You bought into all of these ideas, and that's what stitched everybody together. Antiochus Epiphanes saw the need for enforcing a unifying culture over an extremely diverse population that was his kingdom. I don't think he was a madman for trying to impose a unifying cultural approach because he had to do it. It had to be done or else this this kingdom of his was just going to get picked apart from the West by the Romans, by Persians and Indian groups to the East, to the Ptolemies, to the South, to Arabs, to people inside of his own kingdom. Maybe some of the things he did were mad, but I don't think that big idea was necessarily that nuts. Antiochus wasn't going to be translating any sacred text of his sub- subject people like the more enlightened Ptolemies, cousins down south did. Antiochus's plan was to impose Hellenism come hell or high water. Inside of Judea, there were factions inside of factions inside of factions. There was a pro-Hellenistic group. Antiochus appointed high priests of the temple from this group. Two priests were named Jason and Menelaus. I'm no scholar of Jewish and Hebrew naming conventions, but those don't sound very Hebrew to me. They sound awful Greek. Antiochus worked to turn Jerusalem into a classical Greek polis city state. He built a gymnasium, and we've talked about that before in this uh, series. It was a huge symbol of Hellenism, a place where people hung out, bathed, and were naked. Nakedness was fine with the Greeks, but a major no-no for Second Temple Jews. Not only did they build this gymnasium, they compelled the Jews to attend at least once per year, reminiscent of later Roman practices against the Christians. Antiochus banned Jewish religious celebrations and customs, famously setting up an altar to Zeus and the Holy of the Holies in the temple. He did this on a very specific day in the month of Kislev in the year 168 B.C., Kislev lines up with the Gregorian months of November and December. This event is sometimes called the Abomination of Desolation. Not every Judean was happy with the state of affairs brought on by Antiochus. Oh, can I get your attention for just a second? A great way to support the History of the Papacy podcast is by joining us on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash History of the Papacy. Your support on Patreon goes a long way to help keep the history of the papacy sustainable for a long time in the future. There are four tiers of support on Patreon, Antioch, Alexandria, Constantinople, and Rome. Each of these tiers represents one of the traditional patriarchates of early Christianity. There are many great benefits for supporting the show on Patreon. The most important, though, is being included on the history of the papacy diptychs. In traditional Christianity, the diptychs are the list of bishops commemorated in their order of precedence. The sooner you sign up on Patreon, the higher you will be on the lists of the history of the papacy patrons. Just to set the stage, like put your mind into this. One day in 167 B.C., a Seleucid representative went to a small country town named Modi'in, about eh, 15 odd miles, 23 kilometers northwest of Jerusalem. That's as the crow flies. This area, the hill country, it's up and down and switchbacks. It's probably a 
good day's ride away from Jerusalem, the Seleucid representative was there to make sure the people did their required sacrifices to the Greek gods. The Seleucid rep wanted the local country priest, a leader named Matathias, to do the first sacrifice. Matathias refused. Another person stepped up to do the sacrifices, but then faked out, took the Seleucid representative and killed him. The Jews had their resistance army and their leader, Matathias, along with his five sons, John, Simon, Judas, Eleazar, and Jonathan. This family, soon to be called the Maccabees, Hebrew for hammerers, began an asymmetric or guerrilla war, in other words, a revolt against the Seleucid kingdom. Not long into the revolt, Matathias died. His son, Judas Maccabeus, became the leader of the revolt. Judas was a masterful military commander, and he had his God on his side, at least according to the book of Maccabees and depending on your religious take. Antiochus didn't take the revolt seriously at first. He sent out an insufficient command that was completely destroyed by Judas. The Maccabeans continued their asymmetric warfare, taking the little bites out of the Seleucids, but those little bites took their toll. The Maccabean army grew and then built itself into a Greek-style Alexander army. Even though this Jewish army was small, it was tight, it was tough, and it knew the land. Antiochus started to take this revolt a bit more seriously and sent out one of his strongest armies. That was destroyed too. The path to the biggest prize of them all, Jerusalem, was open to Judas and he grabbed it after a short battle. Two years to the date, on the 25th of the month of Kislev, the temple was freed from Seleucid control. The Jews back then and today use a modified lunar calendar, which doesn't exactly line up with the Gregorian calendar most commonly employed today. That is why Hanukkah can start as early as the end of November and as late as after Christmas. You can probably imagine the wrecked state of that the Maccabeans found the temple in. It was literally and spiritually a mess. So the temple needed a major cleanup, but what were they to do when there was an insufficient supply of holy oil required to rededicate the temple? The menorah in the temple was the sacred seven-branched candelabra of the temple that had all sorts of theological and biblical context and symbols and usages. The Arch of Titus has a carving of that menorah being taken away as war booty after the final destruction of the second temple. That menorah, that candelabra, oil-burning candelabra, was a required element in rededicating the temple. And the rededication of the temple required eight days worth of sacred oil, which connects into the temple of booths described. It needed this undefiled pure olive oil, and they only had one day supply. And this is where the miraculous part of the story comes in. That one day supply lasted eight days, and the celebration of Hanukkah was born. Interestingly enough, this miraculous element is not told in the book of Maccabees, which was written fairly contemporaneously to the events within a few years. First and second Maccabees recount the dedication of the temple, but not that miraculous story. The first recorded account of the miracle part of the oil isn't until the Talmud, which was written in the 500s AD. It should be mentioned that the books of first and second Maccabees are not included in the Masoretic text of the Old Testament used by Jews today and some Christians. These books are included in what's called the Deuterocanonical books used by Orthodox Christians and Catholics, some Catholics sometimes. The Maccabean Revolt was huge. The Maccabees, who would soon be called the Hasmoneans, completely changed the landscape of the Southern Levant, even though they reigned for less than a hundred years. 
we can see that the Maccabean revolt was more than just a revolt. It was a war inside of Judaism. The Maccabees were a tremendous force in the evolution of Judaism. Judaism spread into areas it hadn't traditionally been, including the Galilee. The Galilee region would become a Jewish stronghold outside of Judea. A conflict would develop between different groups of Jews and Jewish sects, Jews living in the Levant and Jews living in the in the diaspora. There were many Jews and many, many Judaisms, as Professor Michael Satlow would say. Some of the cities of the Decapolis and other Greek non-Jewish cities were captured and destroyed, particularly Scythopolis, but also Hippos. The Hasmoneans would expand their Jewish-Judean kingdom well past Judea into Samaria, the Galilee, as far so south as into modern-day Egypt and to the other side of the Dead Sea-Jordan River complex. It's an amazing story of conquest. The Maccabees wouldn't remain as stalwart Jews who despised everything Greek for very long. Within a generation, they would be as Greek as everyone else. That, that pull of Hellenism was so strong, really hard to ignore. So what does Hanukkah, the celebration of the dedication of the temple after this defilement, have to do with early Christianity? Christians do not, as a rule, do all those things, light the menorah, and then set aside Hanukkah as a special celebration. But was that always the case? We know G Jesus himself celebrated Hanukkah as the dedication of the temple holiday. The Gospel of John says that Jesus went to the temple on the feast of the dedication. So the celebration of this feast was clearly a thing during Jesus' time. Did later Christians celebrate this feast? If so, why didn't it stick around? It's really hard to tell. The miraculous elements may not have been widely accepted or even discussed in the first century AD. A great deal of the culture and religion of the Judeans was changing and was changed during the time of the Maccabees. They were creating a people, a kingdom, and a legacy for themselves. This was a time of great innovation and Reformation. It really could be called the Jewish Reformation. The Old Testament, the foundational document for the Second Temple, Jews was being locked in at this time. And we can study this and learn more about it through the Septuagint, the Samaritan Pentateuch, and then the Masoretic text. Early Christians and the other Second Temple Jewish sects had many different choices in how they practiced their religion and what strains of the religion they would pick up. So they may have picked up bits and pieces of what the, what the Hasmoneans and the Maccabeans were doing, but there was also different traditions, apocalypticism, so many things going on and developing at this time. And you can see that's why it's this is a lot messier of a time period than we get through just saying Jews and Christians. I think the big event that changed the idea and the importance of Hanukkah for the proto-rabbinical Jews versus the Christians was the Jewish revolts of the first and second centuries AD. The first Jewish revolt, the Bar Kokhba revolt, the Kedos War, and others. The temple was evolving to lesser importance for the Christians, and the destruction of the temple rocked the other Jewish sects to their foundations. The Hanukkah story must have been a great motivation for the Jews who revolted, Jewish Christians included in that. Uh, I've discussed my thoughts on that word Jewish Christian, but Second Temple Jews who thought of Jesus as maybe the Messiah, maybe the, a prophet or something to that degree, but not going in that proto orthodoxy direction of Jesus and the Trinity. People who were more, maybe you could even say at this point, just more ingrained into the, the other Jewish sects. I think there could have been a very a great spectrum of belief there within proto Christianity, using that word proto a lot today, but I think any one of the sects 
Pharisees, Sadducees, you name it, could have had people who thought Jesus was in some way something, but that's uh, a different story for a different day. What I think a lot of these Jews thought was, hey, the Maccabees were able to fight back and defeat the great kingdom of the Seleucids. Why couldn't the us Jews of the first century and of the Bar Kokhba revolt not be able to do the same thing? I think they had a very good archetype set up there and an idea that how could we fail at doing this? The problem for the Jews was the Romans were not the Seleucids, and they were able to smash all of these revolts. I'm not saying that it wasn't incredibly difficult and costly for the Romans, but they were able to get it done. They were able to shift resources around and devote a ton and ton of soldiers and equipment and the whole force of an empire, a European and tri-continental empire, and throw that all against the Jews, and the Jews still put up a pretty good fight. I think it's possible that Hanukkah and the idea of defending and dedicating the temple became even more important for the proto-rabbinical Jews and an important part of their identity as at the same time, the really the reverse was happening for the Christians. The decrease of the importance of the Second Temple was becoming a part of their identity. We don't need the temple. We've got something else going on. That was a major splitting point between these two factions at this point. So that's the story of Hanukkah. Temples, empires, revolts, destruction, rebuilding, and the formation of the identity of a people. That is how great stories are made and told. I hope that everyone had a happy Hanukkah, because Hanukkah will be over by the time this episode is released, but it'll be ready for many happy Hanukkahs in the future. I'd love to hear what you think about this episode. Next time, we will be talking about more holidays. With that, Happy holidays, everyone. Before we go, let us commemorate the Patreon patrons on the history of the papacy diptychs. We have, at the Alexandria level, Roberto, William B., Brian, Christina, Alex, Augustus, Judy, and Max. At the Constantinople level, we have Dapo, Paul, Justin, Lana, John, Steve, and Sean, who are all magnificent, and reaching that ultimate power and prestige, that of the Sea of Rome, we have Peter the Great, Amma the Great, Jeffrey the Great, Frederick the Great, and Jim the Great. With that, I hope you've enjoyed this piece of the mosaic of the history of the Popes of Rome and Christian Church. 